A water-cooled condenser is a heat exchanger that uses circulating water to reject heat from the refrigerant. Typically, water-cooled condensers utilize shell and tube, plate and frame, or plate and shell heat exchanger designs. Unlike air-cooled condensers, which use ambient air for heat rejection, water-cooled condensers rely on water as the cooling medium, providing efficient heat transfer and enhanced performance compared to most air-cooled condenser designs. The heat transferred into the cooling water causes the water temperature to rise. To address this, the water loop is typically configured with a cooling tower or closed circuit cooler to lower the cooling water temperature. In this video, I'd like to give an overview of a fluid cooling type of condenser. Um, and I have two examples shown here. We're actually going to start with the bottom diagram because this is kind of the typical arrangement. So um, when, when a fluid cooling condenser is, is used, instead of having um, air involved or as an evaporative condenser using air and water, we're strictly using a, a fluid, usually water or a water glycol mixture as the medium to that our heat's getting rejected into. And it usually looks something like this. So we'll have a heat exchanger. It could be a shell and tube like I've drawn here, or it could be a plate and frame. That, that really doesn't matter. But And we have our discharge, our high stage discharge coming from our compressors going into the heat exchanger. And then the, the heat that's in the superheated vapor is getting rejected into the water that's being circulated through this, uh, in this case, shell and tube heat exchanger. The process of doing that, the, uh, the refrigerant is desuperheated okay, first, then once it hits saturation, um, all the heat energy that gets rejected is in the form of latent heat, and it causes it to transition from a vapor back to a liquid where it can drain out as condenser drain, and then usually into a high pressure receiver. That's what's happening on the refrigerant side. So on the water side, it's a pretty simple, pretty simple setup. We just have a, a, a loop where we are pumping water from our closed circuit cooler, okay? We'll talk about that in a second. We're just pumping it through our heat exchanger. Inside the heat exchanger, there's gonna be a, a number of uh, whole tube bundle. Not important to go into that now, but that's what um, comes in a cooler temperature, leaves a warmer temperature. And so we bring it up to our closed circuit cooler and we circulate through this. This closed circuit cooler operates very, very similar to the evaporative condenser we've already looked at. But we don't call it a condenser because nothing is being condensed, right? We're dealing with single phase flow of water, okay? Water enters and water leaves, but that water does change temperature. So that's why we call it a closed circuit cooler because we're cooling the water. But as far as design goes, this is very, very similar to our induced draft condenser diagram that's on the wall, um, on the board next to us. So, so there's two separate water loops going on in this closed circuit cooler. Um, we have a float that I didn't draw that would maintain a water level and then water getting pumped through what I've drawn as a black pipe and sprayed over a tube bundle and inside the tube, tube bundle is our second circuit of water, which is the circuit that's flowing through our heat exchanger to cool, um, to desuperheat and condense the ammonia. So that's kind of the, the most common arrangement for a fluid cooling condenser. However, I, I do want to point out what a cooling tower would be, um, which is, is slightly different than the closed circuit cooler because in the cooling tower arrangement, everything looks exactly the same um, on our heat exchanger. These are, these are identical setups and we're pumping from our, our tower just like we did in this case. But now we don't have two water loops anymore. We only have a single water loop. That's the major difference. So instead of the water being um, being cycled through like it is in the closed circuit cooler, instead it's just going to the top and being sprayed over. And by springing that into droplets, it allows some of that water to evaporate uh, because the air is getting pulled over it, and it's going to cool that water as it evaporate, cool, collect in the sump, where it can be pumped out at a lower temperature. So low temperature enters, a higher temperature leaves, and that continues. Now you might think, well, that seems simpler because you only got one. Um, one loop and I guess that's kind of true but really this is not as good of a system because this fan which is drawing air through that tends to bring in a lot of dirt, dust, debris which is which will cause the water to get dirty over time. Well that water as we're pumping it is now going to go into our heat exchanger, it's going to foul the surfaces and wreak havoc that will be a maintenance maintenance problem. So that's a downside. Furthermore, the water in both of these needs to be treated chemically. And so by, by uh, cycling, by using that same water for both purposes, it creates challenges in that regard as well. So, but that provides the overview that you need to understand the difference between a cooling tower and a closed circuit cooler when it comes to fluid cooling condensers.
A shell and tube condenser consists of a cylindrical shell housing multiple tubes, which provide a large surface area for heat transfer. The refrigerant and water flow through separate paths, allowing heat exchange to occur efficiently. Typically, the refrigerant flows through and surrounds the tubes, while the water is circulated through the tubes. All right, in this video, let's talk about shell and tube condensers. Um, they're not the most common form of condenser, especially in the ammonia refrigeration system, of course, evaporative condenser is, but there's enough of them out there that we need to be familiar with them. And so when I say shell and tube condenser, I'm referring to like a fluid cooling condenser um, that we've looked at in the past, okay? Um, now, if we were to be able to slice this condenser in, in half, this heat exchanger in half, and look at it from the end, we would see something like this. And what I've drawn here is the tube sheet. Uh, what is the tube sheet? Well, it's a circular piece of metal with holes cut into it that tubes will fit perfectly through. Okay, the tube sheet's flat and the holes are grooved because then when the tubes become, they're rolled and expanded, it creates a vapor tight seal. And, and there'll be um, at least two tube sheets, one on each end um, that the tubes then, the bundle of tubes sometimes it's called, fits, fits into and secures them. All right, now with a shell and tube condenser, water or the cooling medium, water glycol mixture, um, is what flows through the tubes. That means that the ammonia or the refrigerant that's being used is what is then um, in the shell or surrounding the tubes, okay? Um, at the end of the tubes, at the end of the heat exchanger, which we call the head, that'd be the rounded portion, which we call the heads, there's also gonna be um, circuit diverters. And what is a circuit diverter? Well, it's a way that we're forcing the flow of water through certain tubes and not through other tubes. And, and this will be the heat exchanger designer's um, job to design that properly so that we get the number of passes um, that we want. So you could have a single pass um, shell and tube heat exchanger in which the water flows through one time and exits on the other end. That's not the most common. You have a two pass where the water is diverting through half the tube and then it comes back through. There's, there's all sorts of different arrangements for, for how the water can be diverted, but that happens at the ends here inside the, the heat exchanger. Okay, so there's single pass, there's also multi-pass, multi all, all, different, all different variations. Um, one thing to keep in mind about shell and tube condensers um, is maintenance on them can be a bit challenging, right? These are heat exchangers. Usually they do have access points, like those heads can be removed, but if you want a picture taking, like unbolting this head, pointed off when you need to get to the bundle, you need to make sure that when you design the, the location where this is gonna be at the plant, that there's room to physically remove the tube bundle. Because if you don't leave room, if you pack it into a corner, you're never going to be able to get access to that. Um, the, the tubes themselves are subject to the same uh, concerns that um, can happen on an evaporative condenser when it comes to scaling. Um, that's that's uh, minerals deposits being left on the tubes, which, which fouls the surface, which will re reduce the capacity. Therefore, um, chemical treatment of the water is necessary in a very similar way as it is for uh, evaporative condenser. Um, there is a unique form, it's beyond the scope of this video, but I'll just mention it here. It's called eddy current testing, which is a form of non-destructive testing that can be done on the tubes of a shell and tube, any shell and tube heat exchanger to kind of measure their integrity. And, um, and then the tubes also can be mechanically clean. There is a process for mechanically cleaning tubes. Of course, it does require opening the ends so, you can, so that you can get to them. So um, those are just some of, the, some of the kind of high level items for a shell and tube condenser. Shell and tube condensers provide efficient transfer due to their large surface area. Furthermore, most shell and tube condensers are ASME stamped heat exchangers, making them durable for industrial applications. The tubes are typically constructed of carbon or stainless steel for ammonia systems. Halocarbon systems, however, will utilize copper tubes, which provide better heat transfer capabilities. A plate and frame condenser consists of a series of thin, corrugated metal plates, typically made of stainless steel. Each plate has a gasket that seals the plate edges to ensure the fluids do not mix. Small plate and frame heat condensers are often seal welded to negate the need of gaskets altogether. Plate and frame heat exchangers are attractive because of their compact size, high efficiency, and ease of maintenance. A pair of plates is often called a cassette. The number of cassettes required will depend on the evaporator load. The cassettes are held together in a frame. The frame can be adjusted to add or remove plates if the refrigeration needs change. 
In a plate and frame condenser, refrigerant enters the unit on one side of the plates and the cooling water on the other side. A big advantage of a plate and frame condenser is that the plate design and narrow channels provide tremendous surface area within a small footprint. As the refrigerant condenses, it collects at the bottom of the unit and drains by gravity to the receiver. All right, unfortunately, my artwork just uh, isn't good enough to draw a plate and frame heat exchanger, so I had to print something off the internet um, so we can do an overview of how a plate, well, really any plate and frame heat exchanger, but in our case, we're talking about plate and frame condensers, which is one type of fluid cooling condenser, all right? Because when you see a plate and frame heat exchanger out in the field, it's, it's not very easy to, to understand what's going on. Um, but what you have, is, and this, this picture here shows it all exploded so we can understand um, what's taking place. But we have these, these plates which have channels um, designed into them, um, and these plates get sandwiched together. This view is great because it shows it's separated. Um, and then you can also see the black rings here around these openings. So, so we have a warm fluid coming in. In the case of a condenser, that would be our ammonia or refrigerant from the compressors entering the condenser. Um, and due to the way the gasketing is, it's going to force the flow down one side of the one side of the plate and then prevent its flow up the other side. So our warm superheated or our hot superheated refrigerant vapor enters and then due to the gasketing, it's forced down this side of the plate. Okay, um, and then some of it keeps going through and it's every other plate that is allowed to, to, to travel through. Okay, and then it's interacting with the, the cooler uh, fluid, which in the case of a condenser would be water or some sort of uh, maybe a glycol solution that then enters the condenser and it's doing the exact same thing but on the opposite side of every plate. So we have warm on one side and we have cold on the other. And because of the way these plates are, there's an enormous amount of uh, surface area, not just because the plates are big, but also the think of all the channels grooved into them, which is increasing the surface area as well. So um, in the end, the same thing happens that happens in every condenser, which is we get um, a condensed refrigerant liquid exiting the condenser that then drains into the, the receiver in most cases. So that provides an overview of how a plate and frame condenser works. A plate and shell condenser is a hybrid design that combines features of both the plate and frame and shell and tube designs, enhancing thermal efficiency and structural robustness. Plate and shell condensers consist of a cylindrical outer shell, similar to a shell and tube heat exchanger, but instead of using tube bundles, they incorporate a pack of corrugated metal plates housed within the shell, like a plate and frame heat exchanger. In many refrigeration applications, the shell is fully welded. This reduces the risk of a leak, which is a benefit, but also prevents the heat exchanger from being modified.